This book is uh, the Nuremberg Chronicle, and this book uh, tells the story, uh, the creation of man, uh, because they all believed in creation, up to the 14th century. It's probably the first printed history of the world, and so we have all the illustrations in woodcut. Yeah, woodcut illustrations, not available anymore. Uh, in, in woodcut art, this was the creme de la creme of woodcuts for that period. This had to be carved into a piece of wood, a block of wood. And not just carved as we see it, but it had to be carved in reverse. And so as we begin the book, there's some really wonderful, here's, here's God creating the world, you know this simple illustration of the hand of God starting to create the world. And, and on this page, as, uh, as you can see, the world beginning to evolve, you know, and come together. And here, the stars are starting to come together. And out here, uh, the birds the trees, the water, and the land all came together. And then the first man, the creation of Adam, coming out of a, a ball of mud, surrounded by the animals. Great, great illustration. And here, this is one of my most favorite illustrations. This is the creation of Eve out of the rib of Adam, coming right out of the body. It, it's absolutely stunning, that woodcut. And this then is Adam and Eve in all their glory in the Garden of Eden. And so the book then continues on. It's explaining the world as it was in those times, right up to the time of printing. This, this book, of course, went to, was, it was borrowed uh, by the University of Saskatchewan for a display. And they uh, digitized every page of this book. We, we were absolutely delighted here because we, we don't know for sure how many volumes exist in the world, let alone in Canada. Uh, this book has been um, at the University of Cape Town. This book has been in Belfast, in Ireland. We pick it up when it became the property of an architect in Vancouver by the name of uh, Gardner. He purchased it from a German refugee down in South America shortly either during or shortly after the war. And this was his only possession. And he sold this to Mr. Gardner so that he could survive, so that he could live. Mr. Gardner had it in Vancouver for many, many years. Father Murray knew of it. And Father Henry Carr, a great, great friend of Father Murray's, whose uh, stained glass window is in the church. And Father Henry Carr got word that Mr. Gardner w would be willing to sell this uh, wonderful book. Father Murray's first response was ask him to donate it to the college. Uh, he said he would like to, but he didn't feel he could. So they put the price on it. Father Carr must have been quite a mediator between the two because Mr. Gardner eventually decided to sell it to Father Murray for his collection for the price that he paid the gentleman in South America many, many years earlier, which was $600. Father Murray course, didn't have $600. He never had a penny to his name. 
but he didn't want to take from the meager funds that he was running the college on. So he, he said, ask Mr. Gardner to give me a month and I'll raise the money. And what he did was he cut down on his cigarettes. Everywhere Father Murray went, uh, people would give him a dollar or five dollars or whatever they could do to help. And in about three and a half weeks, he told Father Carr that Mr. Gardner Noah had the $600. So Father Carr made the arrangement. But then a strange thing happened. One of his students from the Congo, I think it was, became terribly, terribly homesick to the point where he was physically ill and needed in the worst way to go home. So Father Murray's great prize, his book, got shelved and he used the $600 to send this young student back to Africa. When the students heard of this, the students and their parents made a collection Father Murray was unaware of this. They made a collection. They bought the book through Father Carr. And when they arrived in Wilcox to present the book to Father Murray, and I am told by eyewitnesses that's one of the first times they ever saw him cry since World War II because when he would get news of his students being killed, injured, lost, that's when he would cry. That's when the tears would fall. Well, this is, uh, this is hand printed. This is not of a printing press. And this is in, uh, this would be uh, printed in the monastery. And if you, back in the 13th century, if, if you had the ability to read, if you were educated enough to read and wanted to read this book, you would have to go to the monastery, like a library, and read it in the library. And this would be chained to the desk so that uh, you couldn't walk away with it because there are no copies. So, th so these, we have three of these types of books and they are, you know, just wonderful examples of, um, of handwritten manuscripts. Well, this is the other one. Uh, and this, of course, uh, is missing a fair bit. But the interesting uh, one about this one is, again, it is made out of skin and with holes in it. Many of the pages have holes, some, some much bigger than this. And the holes, which I at one point uh, originally thought might be from careless cigarette smoking uh, or something of that nature, uh, it turns out that the holes were originally wounds in the skin of the animal that had healed up. But in the stretching and scraping of the skin to get it ready for the use as, a, as, uh, as vellum, uh, the holes opened up again. And because the material was so precious back then, uh, they didn't... They didn't waste anything. They left the holes in, and because it's handwritten, you don't lose any words because you write around it, right, right around the imperfection. Wonderful example there. Now this, this really is one of, uh, it's just an amazing example of um, wonderful story being written on skin. And here in detail, and I'm not sure if you can see it, 
uh, but it you can see the lines scribed to keep the lines straight. They look like pencil, but they are not pencil. These lines were made by a metal tool, like, like the, 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 the point of a compass. And so these are indentations in the skin. And that's what forms these lines. Uh, thick, rather thick pages. And the, the, uh, as you can see, the capitals are beautifully uh, illustrated. It's called illumination. Many important works, especially many of the Bibles, uh, some of the illuminated capitals take up a whole page. And many of these t told hidden stories. This is a remnant, of course, it's an incomplete book. Uh, there are many, much of it is missing, but I know of no other copy anywhere else other than this. You know, the, the Nuremberg Chronicle has, many, has copies in, you know, different countries and different libraries, um, but this, I know of no other copy. 13th century, hand printed, as opposed to hand-written. The origin of some of these books, uh, you know, where they started is unknown, but uh, Father Murray had uh, his father, a very wealthy man in Toronto, uh, had a wonderful library of books. And so F Father Murray eventually uh, inherited those books. Uh, Father Bacciocci, who had come up to Canada to retire uh, and who had spent most of his life in Louisiana, and he had in his possession an amazing collection of books. And Father Murray commented on Father Bacciocci's collection. He said, I am not envious of many things but I am envious of his rare book collection. And so when Father Bacciocci died, um, the collection was granted to Father Murray. And they brought that collection of beautiful rare books in the back of a half-ton truck to, to, uh, to Father Murray. General Robert E. Lee's Nice was also a correspondent and a friend of Father Murray. And when Father Murray sent out an appeal for donation of books to, 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 to start this library and get it going, Robert E. Lee's niece sent a truckload of books from Robert E. Lee's personal library that she was the custodian of and gave them to Father Murray for his library. The, the, the whole birth of this collection and the collection of books in, in Lane Hall all came about because one of the conditions of Father Murray getting a charter to teach the university courses was that he had to have uh, a library, and a, a proper library in this. And there's about approximately 400 rare books in this collection. Um, it, I've been told by many, many visitors, the University of Saskatchewan, uh, experts and professors there, that this is an exceptional collection of rare books. Thank you.